Okay, so hello and welcome to this afternoon session. My name is Michael Felber and I'm very happy to be here with you today. I thought against all kinds of odds to stand here now and I spent like one week in isolation uh, nearly, uh, but I'm really happy to be able here and to tell you how I learned to stop worrying and implement the Dukti myself. So perhaps um, first some kind of introduction about myself. So I was at some point a member of the Duc team in Paris as a postdoc and uh, I, I used to generate proofs from the proof assistant um, Isabel. And I used the Dukti to verify the proofs that I had exported. And this usually involved some waiting uh, every time I um, made some new proofs. So at some point I asked myself, how efficient is the Dukti, the Dukti actually? Um, is it fast or is it slow or what? And I had actually nothing to compare it to. It was, it was basically the only implementation. Um, so I thought I'd just implement it again to find out if I can do better. And uh, there was this um, anecdote from Shil Dawek that a PhD student should basically be able to re-implement it in one week. And so I thought, yeah, okay, I'm not a PhD student anymore, so perhaps I'm a bit faster, like six days or so, but there is Hofstadter's law that says that things take even longer uh, than you planned, even if you take into account Hofstadter's law. So um, in the end, it took me like, I would say several months or so, and I'm even not sure whether I'm already finished. So um, anyway, uh, so, but very, very much at the beginning of my uh, work, I already set out to make some kind of a wish list. And I thought, what will I put on this wish list? I can start from zero, I can do anything I want. So you could think, okay, I want a nice syntax, I want nice error messages, I want it to be fast, I want it, whatever. Um, and I found out relatively soon that um, I, I cannot do all of this. There is like uh, some fundamental tension between these goals and uh, the French, uh, this is some illustration of the French equivalent of um, to have uh, your cake and eat it too. Uh, so we have to make certain choices, what we want. So um, what I then, what, what is the fruit of my work is uh, called Controlli. So Controlli is this alternative implementation of the Dukti, uh, which you can check out at this, uh, at this link, right? And um, my personal wish list uh, was first to make this thing minimal. So I'm trying to respect the 80-20 principle to be able to check like 80% of the theories, but to only invest like 20% of the effort to do the implementation. And uh, I think this, I, I succeeded with that because the kernel of um, Controlli is about five times um, smaller than the kernel of the Dukti. Um, so I hope that this is also a nice thing for beginners to look at and to learn from it. Um, it's also, um, uh, I wanted to make this fast and it has actually served um, well as a test bed for multi-threaded uh, theory checking. And it has um, in benchmarks um, been quite successful at being the fastest proof checker for the lambda by modulus um, lambda by calculus modulo. And I wanted this to be also as much compatible to the Dukti as possible, so to understand syntax, but also somehow in spirit. Um, and uh, last but not least, to have like a second opinion to the Dukti. So in case that the Dukti should at some point contain a bug, that perhaps the same bug is not present in Controlli, so that we can like cross-check the, the output of the two tools. And uh, why do you, why should you actually care about all of this? Well, my goal for this talk will be to share a little bit of what I learned during the implementation of Controlli with you. Um, and I want you, I want you to be able to tackle fun projects. 
Um, for example, you might you can do a lot of stuff just processing existing deductive theories, of which there are rec actually quite many. And you can do stuff like you can transform these deductive theories to some proof blockchain, which is actually something that I did at some point in, in Prague. Or you can try to learn theorem proving with all kind of machine learning uh, um, machinery. Um, that is actually also something that the colleague at some point was interested in doing. Or you might do um, the deductive community a great service by um, researching how to compress these deductive proofs. And this is actual big data at its best. You will get, I'm sure, very nice funding for these kind of projects. Um, but I'm also trying to give you some basis to be able to do something, some more non-standard use of the Ducti, like, for example, implementing some new stuff into the Ducti, or perhaps even to re-implement it, if you are going my route. Okay, so what I will be talking about concretely um, today are these four topics. I will talk about parsing, then I will talk about theory checking, um, which will involve talking a bit about reduction. And in the last part, I will talk a little bit about sharing and memory. All right, so let's go uh, right into it. But first, a little bit of preliminaries. Um, I will not bother you too much with the definition of terms, because I'm sure by now you have already seen this a million times during this school. Um, but uh, I will remark one thing that I noted while I implemented Controlli, that is the way how you model terms in a proof checker has an enormous impact on performance. And uh, this was very often that I did some slight change to the layout of my terms, and this turned out to have like a huge, mostly negative uh, impact, but sometimes I made this little change and boom, it got much faster. Uh, so there is really a lot you can sometimes get from just getting this term type right. The second thing uh, is commands. So I have, I adopt some kind of very simplified view for this talk on deducti, where I say there are basically two types of commands in a deductive theory, um, where the first type basically introduces a constant of a given type, and the second type of commands introduces a rewrite rule. And uh, a theory in deducti is just a sequence of these commands, one after each other. Okay, so now let's go into the first real subject, parsing. And by the way, if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. I'm prepared to um, be flexible. So, parsing. Um, as I said before, these, these fun projects, this first category, just processing deductive theories, you can actually get pretty far with only using a parser. Um, but there are challenges to parsing deductive files because these deductive files can be really, really large and they might not even fit your, into your memory. So you cannot just do, uh, you have to use some parser that is spe specially prepared to do this. Also, the, the smallest elements in these um, commands, which are the terms, can be also very large. So I'm just saying that you need some parser that is prepared for this. And the performance of the parsing um, is also something that I found out to be um, quite important for the overall performance of proof checking. So here I show you in this chart um, like these four bars where the first two show Controlli and Dodukti just the parsing part. And you can see that the deducti parser is several uh, times slower than the controlli parser, and which, and this is actually in the end responsible for why deducti takes um, much longer actually than than controlli to uh, to completely process a theory. So, yeah, as I, as it's written here, it can really take the parsing can really take up. Uh, to half of the total proof checking time. So it's important to make this fast. Now there are several existing parsers um, for deductive files. 
So there is, of course, the, um, the, the parser that is integrated in the Dukti, the implementation. Um, this is an automatically generated parser, which uh, has quite good error reporting, and it has uh, support for the full Dukti syntax by definition, because it is the reference implementation. On the other hand, there is a second parser that is written in Rust, and that is, it is written by me, and uh, it supports differ different modes of parsing, which I will explain um, in a bit, this lazy and strict parsing with and without scoping, and it is optimized for performance, as I showed you before. It has an easy to use API, so there is like a documentation for it, uh, and some examples how to use it, and I will show you uh, an example in a bit also. And on the other hand, it has really shitty error reporting. Uh, and uh, it supports a lot of this deductive syntax, but not quite everything. But uh, it's quite enough, at least for everything that I checked. Uh, and yeah, my tip to you is to please don't go and implement yet another parser. It's so much work. And you will probably take a lot of time to get this really right. Um, please use just one of these things that exist there and be happy. Um, now, about the strict and lazy parsing. So, um, the strict parsing basically works like this. You read a file completely into the memory, and then, only once it's read completely, uh, then you start to parse it. This has, if you read uh, the whole file from the start to the end and you use all of the commands in it, then this has lower total runtime. And this is also easier to implement than lazy parsing. Lazy parsing, on the other hand, it parses a file line by line. And this is nice because um, we get out actually the commands usually much earlier because the parsing starts basically only uh, once a single line has been read and not after the whole file has been read. And also, we, uh, this consumes much less memory um, yeah, because we only keep a single line in, in memory at any time. Uh, then there's the second thing, that is scoping. So, um, in, so in general, when we parse a file, uh, when we parse a term here, then this, um, we have this fx uh, here. And this will become, this will be mapped to some Debrun indices, which just encode these variables as uh, natural numbers. And this is good if we do this already in the parser, because um, this saves us memory. We don't have to store a string. We can just uh, store these as integers. On the other hand, it takes more time if we do this in the parser because we need to always keep track of bound variables or for every symbol that we read, we have to check has it been bound and where has it been bound and so on. But often we have to do this conversion to the brain. This is anyway for proof checking. So um, this can often, so it's not really a, a big deal if we do this, if it takes more time. Okay, so now um, I have here this example. This is a full uh, code example for a pretty printer um, using this Rust library that I wrote, the Dukti Pass. And I will, I will sh quickly go through uh, this with you. You can see the mouse, I hope. Yes. So in these two first lines, this is Rust code that will just read the standard input line by line. Um, but it will do this lazily. Um, these, the next two lines here will then parse the commands in the standard input. And this really scary looking type in, in that line here, that is actually saying that it will do it lazily and it will do it without scoping. This is this simp, uh, this, uh, this simp string here. Um, but don't worry if you don't get the precise, this precise thing going on here. And the last two lines are what actually triggers the parsing. Uh, and here we are just printing these, um, these uh, commands uh, that, we, that we parsed. And I, I can show you now actually how you can 
how you can um, make a little project uh, with, with this. So we can make a new project here. So I call it Cargo um, Ko FMT2. And we go into this. And we then go into this file here, um, which is called Cargo Tommel. And here I put in a new dependency on this um, and this library that I wrote, and I give it the correct version, and then I will just check this whether I, I made some some uh, error, and I actually have no internet here, so I just have to do this offline. So uh, yeah, that should normally be a bit uh, more less less flawed when you do it at home. Okay, in the same time, I will here go back and I will do this. I will copy this here. <coughs> and now it has already finished compiling. I go to the main file and I copy paste this stuff in here. All right, I check it again. This should, this should work, I hope. And once that this is done. Why huh? do you have this saved offline now? Ah, this is an interesting uh, question. I honestly don't know. I, I believe that it will just skip this check once and just say, oh, we have already updated the package database. And then we'll just assume from then on that it's updated. I think from time to time it will just check whether there are new packages, but I don't know exactly how this is triggered. <laughs> okay. Oops. Now that there is some weird stuff going on, and I think that this might be because of some weird. Oh, well, this is very strange. So let us just go to the escape hatch because here I have the same thing but this should work okay let's just suppose it's never happened I, I guess it's because of the copy pasting from PDF will probably insert some weird characters that are not uh, expected to be there or so but anyway this the file is basically the same yeah it's just the, the formatting is also better here anyway so here we can now run this and it's just sitting there and it does nothing. That's because we are reading from standard input. And now I can just communicate with this. And I can just say A is of type type. And it will give it back to me. But notice there is now this little, this uh, colon uh, has just moved a little bit. That's because it's pretty printing it. And we can now also like do like two things in the same line. And it will give us back this in in uh, uh, yeah, in two lines separated. Or we can just, just do crazy stuff we don't know yet. Just A is of type what? Yeah, I don't know, B. And then it will give it back to us. So this is actually working. And when you are able, if you're able to just set up such a project like this, and you replace that part where um, it is saying this print line, then you can do all kinds of marvelous stuff with these proofs. The sky is the limit. Um, now I have some second demo. Um, and this there I show you that like Deka check, so the, 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 the proof checker in the Dukti does also really do this kind of work. Um, and uh, I will show you that. So I will first make up some, um, some commands basically like these ones here before with this A, but now a bit more of them. So uh, I will just make here this code will just type, uh, make us 101 commands. And now this is however very fast. So let's just give this a bit more work. Let's just make it now a million. Uh, okay, this now takes a lot of time. Um, let's just check how much time it really takes. 
So we, we time this, but we actually don't want to measure the time that this prints to the console. We want to measure the time that this really takes to generate, so we just move it to the garbage can. And now we wait, but not too long. It's only four seconds. Um, and now I show you what happens if we feed this to Decacheck. Um, and here I have to say that we are reading from standard input and we give it the module name mod. And I want to show some output here with this V flag. And you see it actually started after less than one second. So this means that it's doing this lazy parsing that I told you before, because if it would have read the whole input, it would have only started after roughly four seconds. And now it's just turning away. And I would like you to remark that it's somehow a little bit jumping around uh, and that it's waiting a little bit. And this is a nice little effect that I observed. Did you observe this? Yeah, <coughs> you observed it? And now, this is a bit unfair, I'm really sorry. And now I'm trying the same with, with, my, uh, with my proof checker. And I also let it give this output. And you see, do you, rem do you remark the jumping? No jumping. Do you have any idea what could be the jumping? Garbage yes, it's the garbage collection, quite probably. And here you can see it like visually what garbage collection does or what happens if you don't have it. Anyway, it doesn't have a real uh, effect normally on a, on a user, but it's, I find it interesting that this is like visually visible. Okay, so now I transitioned to the, to the theory checking part. By the way, can you tell me how much time I roughly still have? Because I don't know when we started. Half an hour, okay, good. So until 35. Good, so let's go for theory checking. So now a bit of a different story from now. So um, how, what does deducti, what does decacheck do when we, when, we did this, when we did this thing here, how does this work? What will it perform when we perform this command? So it will actually process for each of the command in the theory, it will distinguish these two types. And if the command introduces a new constant of a given type, then it will check that this constant has a new name and that the type of this T is a sort. And, uh, Otherwise, if the command introduces a rewrite rule, then uh, the Ducti will check that the rewrite rule preserves the types of terms. Um, and uh, then uh, the Ducti adds this command to the global context, gamma, which is at the start empty, so that it, will, that it can use this information later on. Now we need to know about two things. First, we need to find out how can we get the type of a term. And the second thing is, how can we check that a rewrite rule preserves types? So this is called subject reduction. And let's just start with the fir first thing. So how do we get the type of a term? And um, this is the task of type checking or inference in this case. And here we apply uh, rules such as this two ones that I showed you here, where the gamma is a local context, which allows us to store uh, information about which uh, type has each variable. And there are um, quite easy rules such that the first one that says that in any given context, the type has type kind. And there are more complex ones like this one here, which establishes uh, how we can um, get the type of a product. Um, you will, if you are going through the deducti source, however, find that these, um, these rules are not all really in the code looking uh, exactly like this, because you will see these instances of, of conversion or convertibility floating around. And this is actually, um, it, in, in, the, in the formal description of the calculus, there you have this conf rule. And this is a very, very powerful rule. It basically tells you that you can, uh, in order to say that some term has a certain type B, 
you can actually also just show that it has a type A, and then you show that these two types are convertible. Extremely powerful, but unfortunately not suitable for computation, because that uh, using such a rule directly or implementing it directly would require us to come up with some nice way to choose this B. Um, and uh, we cannot do this kind of guessing efficiently, so deductit does not actually implement directly this conful. Instead of this, it modifies all of the other rules in such a way that uh, we could basically emulate this conf rule. So if you don't find this conf rule implemented anywhere directly with some little com uh, comment conf here, then don't worry, this is all perfectly normal. Here the implementation diverges from the theory a bit. Next thing, subject reduction. So this is when we're having a rewrite rule. How does deductive check that the rewrite rule preserves types? So first, I will tell you what deductive does not do, but which is my basically shortcut thing to avoid a lot of work. So um, I take this example here where we have a rewrite rule, which rewrites from square of x to multiplication of x with x. And here we have a variable, x, which has type net. OK, so we could just uh, check that uh, subject reduction here. If we put the variable bindings, in this case just x is of type net, into the local context delta, then we find the type of the left-hand side of the rewrite rule, and we find the type of the right-hand side of the rewrite rule, and then just check that they are convertible. OK. so. This is a, a very nice and simple algorithm. Um, however, it does not uh, always work like this because there can be cases, for example, where we are not actually given these types of the, in the rewrite rules. So we might be just given x. And you should be normally, when you look at the type signature of square or of mult, then you can usually, you, sh you should say, yeah, you can actually come up with the type of x. Um, but it's actually not so simple, and I was really amazed by the amount of code in the Dukti that is just basically there to, to check this um, subject reduction when not all the um, variables are annotated with types. Um, so in this case, the Dukti uses something it's called bidirectional type checking, so it has actually two different kinds of type checking algorithms which are independent of each other and this one this is a real sorry this is a real bitch uh, this is a really really hard uh, really hard algorithm I think I have never understood how it works um, and this is a really hard problem to do it um, so I omitted this from the controlly kernel uh, and just said this is out of my scope um, and yeah this is basically the way things are. So uh, every time you make a rewrite rule, you have to annotate your variables. Um, is that the difference? Because you said yes? your control doesn't type check everything the duct does. So what are the things that it doesn't? This so, one? Um, so uh, the thing is, it will actually control it has some, some kind of escape hatch. So if, you, if it takes this um, rewrite rule here without the variable, then it will actually just say, oh, there is something without uh, a type here. So I don't know, is this, uh, does this rewrite rule satisfy subject reduction or not? So I just accept it, but I give you an, a little warning message. This allows you to go forward if you feel confident, um, but yeah, it just flashes a little error sign, uh, a little warning sign, so you have to be sure that this is really like preserving subject reduction. There are, however, um, so this here doesn't really restrict you from using it. Um, and also, usually in these theories that I have encountered, there are actually not so many rewrite rules that are being defined in such a way that this is required. So it's usually a finite number. Um, and usually you can, so it's like perhaps, I don't know, two or three of them. And then you can just say, okay, I have these three warnings here. I can check these first with the ducti, and then go on using controlling. That's something that you can do. 
Other questions so far? <laughs> sorry, sorry about that the question. You haven't answered my sub question. What are other oh. things that the Holy Spirit will give us? Ah, that's uh, because I will actually answer the question uh, a bit uh, in the course of this. Okay. Uh, but fair enough, sorry. I, I missed this one. <laughs> Any other questions so far? Yes, please. I thought that um, the doxy does not check that books left and right hand side can be typed, but instead that it's checked that the right hand sides can be typed, assuming that the left hand side is well typed. Um, so it's well typed now that the left hand side is right. Well yes, as I, as I said, I'm, I, I could not put my hand into the fire uh, for saying what the Dukti actually does. I think for this there are more proficient people here in the room. I'm just saying that this is quite complex I'm not personally feeling confident enough to understand it. So uh, yes, for this, I'm just saying that this first thing is a quite nice approximation, works nicely, and it's something that you can probably also really just look at on the paper and understand like in three minutes or so. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I agree. This is the first approach is also what I implemented for rewrite tools in Arglab so. Ah, I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what makes... Yes. Okay. More questions? Good. So let's continue. So there is uh, one part that we're still missing, that is convertibility. So I told you before, we check here that these types are convertible. I also said here that we have this convertibility rule. So now how do we check actually that the two terms are convertible? So there is uh, this really nice small algorithm in the Dukti, and it first checks uh, for these two types, whether um, when they are just the same, then we just return true, they are convertible. Otherwise, uh, the Dukti reduces these types, uh, these terms to weak head normal form, and then analyzes them with, this, with something like, in, like this table three here, and so we have here, for example, if we have um, a lambda uh, on both sides, then we will just check whether these, um, these things, these terms here on the, on the right side are convertible. Uh, or if we have an application, then we have to check that like all of the parts of the application match up. Or if we have on both sides constants, which is the first case here, then we have no constraint. To, uh, to consider here. And if something does not match any of these cases, then the, the terms are not convertible. So this is a really nice small algorithm. I like it a lot. Um, a yes? On line two, we have lambdas that are empty lists. So mm -hmm. this is the type A, why is it type B? Yes. Um, so I think this is something that is kind of implicitly, um, that this is kind of implicitly true that this A and the B have to be convertible, at least in the implementation. Um, uh, I think this, might, this must be some kind of meta property that you can only convert these things that um, are convertible if this A and B are, are the same. Or otherwise, um, otherwise said, I think, that if this T and the U are um, convertible, then the A and the B probably must be convertible by some kind of construction. I'm not sure actually about this. Uh, so I have an identity yeah. function on type A and an identity function on type B, but A and B are not. Yes, that's, that's true. So um, uh, and for this case, I'm, 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 uh, I agree. I actually don't know why you don't have to do this. Why you don't have to check for convertibility? I can just. They yeah? don't have the same type, the two A and two B. Yeah, exactly. So it's an invariance that you can only call this algorithm when both things have convertible types. And then because phi types are injected, you also get that ah, the A and B are convertible. Types. Uh -huh. No, you, you just preserve it as an invariance during a conversion check. That you're only ever comparing things that have the same. When you invoke the 
So I think he's trying to say that when, you are call when you're checking that these things are convertible, then this is some kind of a constraint that has to be upheld. Um, yes. I'm, yeah, I'm, I don't know precise, I, I'm, I've, yeah, I think I'm still not completely sure how, what is going on here, but I probably better to discuss this afterwards. Okay, good. So um, there's now still one thing that is missing, namely this reduction. Uh, um, how do we actually reduce now these uh, terms to wicked normal form? And for this, there is a whole section here because it is actually a rather large topic. Um, so in the controlling kernel, to provide you some statistics, reduction is actually about 40% of the whole kernel. So actually, and, and to just say something, that the controlling kernel is actually pretty cool because it's implementing like an interpreter for a lazy functional programming language and a type checker in just like this uh, roughly uh, 700 lines of code. So it does really a lot of stuff for this little amount of lines. So um, what are these challenges? Why is this reduction so, um, so, so complicated? That is because it has to um, deal with several issues. So first, the evaluation in the Ducti is lazy. So if you have this uh, if then else function, um, then it will actually only evaluate one of its, uh, its arguments, um, depending on whether the first argument is true or false. Um, it also has to deal with sharing. So if we have some function that duplicates an argument, then we will have to take care later that if we evaluate, for example, the first argument of this, uh, of this add function here, if we evaluate this later, then we, w we don't want this second argument um, to be evaluated uh, at a later point as well. So we want to preserve this kind of uh, evaluation information between these two arguments. Also, we have uh, equality constraints. So we can have rewrite rules where the left-hand side has two times the same variable in it. And when we apply this rewrite rule, we also then have to check like whether, all, uh, whether these two arguments are actually convertible. So there is a lot of uh, complexity in there. And in the Ducti, um, this uh, reduction is implemented um, using abstract machines. Ooh, scary term, abstract machines. What are these? So uh, these abstract machines, they consist uh, basically of three elements. Um, uh, such an abstract machine state is uh, a context, which is some substitution that is applied to the second element, namely just the term. And the third uh, element is some stack. And this is just uh, an, a number of arguments that are applied to the term with the substitution before. And if we... Um, and now I have a little example. How does this work in practice? Um, so here um, I'm trying to match some term, namely some if then else equality zero one fg with some re with some pattern, namely this ite true tf. And for this, what happens in that case? Um, we first convert this term here. Uh, to some machine state, so to uh, this, this uh, triple form I showed you before. And here we get that this term is just the head, so it's this ITE symbol, and the stack consists of this EQ and F and G. And now when we match this uh, machine, um, this machine with the, with the rewrite pattern, this will need to evaluate this EQ uh, subterm, and this would, will evaluate it probably if we have a well-behaved implementation of EQ. This will um, this will evaluate it to bottom, and this um, way, when we have this evalu evaluated this, then we can update the stack so that the stack will now contain a new um, our evaluated version of EQ zero and one. And uh, we can do this update here nicely because the stack has this 
um, creates this, this, this signature uh, state ref list. So we can like mutate uh, this, these elements in this list. Um, and that then when we have uh, seen that, okay, we didn't, we couldn't match uh, our machine with this pattern here, but we can perhaps uh, match it with some other pattern. Um, uh, we can perhaps match it with some other pattern. Uh, we do not need to redo this uh, evaluation of the first argument of ET ITE again because we, um, because we updated the stack. So we can save some work. And this is a kind of a general mechanism that is also um, quite useful in other situations. And this is, I would say, this is some kind of memorization. And this is something that these um, abstract machines allow, but they also allow um, this lazy evaluation and so on. So it's a really quite nice and powerful um, mechanism, but unfortunately I don't have the time to go a bit more into that. It's a, there's a whole paper about this. What is the context for our example? Ah, I, I, um, actually I was just lazy in some sense, assuming that if I don't say it, then it's just empty. But yeah, it's just empty. In this, in this uh, example, the context doesn't play a role. But you can somehow see that this laziness here that you have in the type of the context, this is responsible that we can do lazy evaluation. So what, we, this, what, this, what, are the, what the power of the evaluation model is, is reflected here quite nicely in the types. This I find quite interesting actually. And it looks so simple, but it's actually really, really complicated to get this right. Can you give an example of what you see in the context? I, I don't understand. Ah, um, well, the context could be just something that would match like a variable, like some de Bruyn index to some term, which is however only lazily evaluated. So we might have some term which has some, some uh, some variable, like if you have this um, identity function, then you have this x, and if you apply it to something id of, let's say, fib42, then um, you would, this fib42, uh, then you would have, in the context, you would just have a fib42, and uh, the term would just be like variable zero. And this would then just refer you to this context, to this element FIP42, which is, however, not yet evaluated because it's lazy. Okay. Yes. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. Now there is one more thing. Uh, how, how am I doing with the time? Okay. Okay, that should work. So there's yet another thing in the Ducti, uh, namely decision trees. So to do pattern matching um, with many overlapping patterns, uh, there is this uh, there is this technique uh, decision trees that's that's implemented, and I show you here some quite notorious example from the from the Sudoku solver that is coming with the Ducti. I don't know whether you have heard about it, but there's a nice Sudoku solver. It's a really nice gimmick. Uh, and here, um, what these decision trees would say, it would, they would first probably check this, the first argument that we are, um, that we're giving to get C. And depending on what this first argument is, the um, decision tree algorithm would then just jump directly to the right uh, variable that is, uh, that, is, that is corresponding to this x here and uh, would then bind it to, to something that we could retrieve it, that we can retrieve it here in the, in the right hand side. Um, my algorithm, which I implemented on the other hand, in Controlli is doing something much more naive. It would also first check the, the first argument but then it would actually probably check again every every other argument would just say, okay, every other argument check um, just uh, matches anything. And only then it would probably get here, for example, to this X and bind it to, the, uh, to some variable that we can have on the right-hand side. So um, in a nutshell, 
these uh, decision trees, they can uh, accelerate uh, reduction when we have a lot of rewrite rules or when we have rewrite rules with many arguments or with some kind of a non-trivial evaluation order of the arguments. But um, at least for the theories that I considered, there were not so many rewrite rules. So in the end, I did not need to implement this because with I did not see some substantial difference in the execution speed uh, between the Ducati and Controlli here. And now to come back to one of your questions, one of these things that I also did not implement is higher order pattern matching. So this is, um, here I show you an example that is from the encoding of COC. So we have here some uh, for all function to which we apply lambda x true. And this is on the left hand side of the rewrite rule. And um, yeah, this is uh, something uh, that's taking quite a lot of effort also to implement. And um, I found that many theories such as most um, nearly any like of these first order or higher order logic like theories do not actually use this kind of uh, patterns. So I also did not implement this, saving again like several hundreds of lines of code. Actually, this is actually I already implemented it at some point, but I could not really, I wasn't so confident that my implementation was correct um, because I did not have like my own dog food to test it on. S but it doesn't um, preclude that if somebody else who is motivated, uh, and who is really liking higher order pattern matching and who would like to get it into some open source project, and you know, things can happen. <laughs> okay. So this goes now for the last part, which is sharing. So sharing is um, some concept that is implicit in many functional programming languages. And in other languages, it's explicit, such as in, uh, in Rust, for example. And um, let us consider this little example here. So in the first example, I declare two times a variable, um, two variables where I assign zero to both of them. And we can see here that uh, in, in the second example, I assign also two times, uh, I also create two variables where the first one is zero and the second one, I just say it's the same as the first one. And here, um, we can see that afterwards we have these checks and they, and they do not like yield the same thing. So in the first example, we have uh, that they are structurally the same, these two variables, but they are not physically the same, which is these two um, equal signs in OCaml. So this, uh, these two equal signs are nice. They mean that we are actually sharing this A and this B, they are pointing to the same memory address. And this allows us to compare such these things nicely because we can compare them by their memory address only. It's a constant time operation. And this thing is um, actively exploited in the Ducti. Um, and for example, there, how are the constants um, dealt with? The Ducti does it in such a way that when it um, has, when it's processing at the beginning, uh, all the constants, it will map constants that are equal to a single canonical constant. And then this allows it later to only compare constants by pointer address. It will never have to do this slow um, character wise comparison, which is implied by structural equality. And in the same spirit, it also uses sharing for more global, more, more lar larger terms. So it will try to actually reuse existing terms um, instead of creating new terms whenever this is possible. So one example from the deductive source is that substitutions um, will have some check whether the substitution does actually change uh, the term, whether it yields really a different term from the input, and only if it does, then it returns a new term. Otherwise, it will reuse or recycle, if you want, the old term. And this allows us also often to have a fast term comparison, 
because um, we can just compare the addresses first of two terms because there's a chance that they might be actually physically the same. And this is a very fast thing to check. Now, um, a bit now for a bit, let's go a bit more deeper into memory management and that is memory allocation. So I found that proof checking D or allocates lots of memory and this is mostly because of we are creating lots of terms, lots of intermediate terms. And um, the memory allocator is the part that manages the, the, the objects that are written to memory. And as a little experiment, at some point, I tried to use a different memory allocator than the one that is used by default in Rust. And I uh, stumbled upon mimalloc, which is a memory allocator that was originally created for the proof assistant Lean. And I, to, my, to my great surprise, I, I added these three lines and I saw that this boosted enormously the, the, the performance of the, of the proof checker. Um, and this is something like which would have taken me like uh, normally other, other, other um, optimization efforts of mine would probably have needed like two or three months to like achieve such a, such a huge um, thing. And this, boom, I make this in five minutes and I see it so, so fast. So I was uh, quite enthusiastic about this and I think that perhaps uh, there might be still like some gains to be to be yielded for in the ducti also performance wise if we would um, tune a little bit the garbage collector settings but this is my personal hypothesis I don't know whether this really holds okay this already brings us to the end um, so I told you a little bit about controlli which is an alternative implementation of the Ducti, which focuses mostly on a nice small kernel and performance. Um, I told you that the representation of terms is crucial for the performance of a proof checker. And that also parsing is a surprisingly um, costly operation, which is hard to really get right. So please use an existing parser. You can also get really far just using uh, a parser. So even if you don't understand all of this type checking stuff, how it really works, or if you just don't care, then you can still do amazing projects with it, with the Ducti. Uh, I sh showed you also that reduction is uh, quite a hairy beast because of these different effects such as lazy evaluation, memoization, and so on. And that also uh, I just, decided to cut some things out of my implementation, like this uh, co more complicated subject reduction check or the higher order matching. Uh, then I showed you that the sharing of, of constants is a, a nice way to save time and memory cheaply, but which is something that you can easily break if you don't watch out for it or if you're not aware of it. And finally, that the memory allocation strategy seems to have a quite large impact on the performance. I thank you for your attention and I hope you will have a lot of fun playing with the Ducti or Controlli. <laughs> Do we still have time for questions? Yeah, sure. Cool. Yes, please. Yeah, so I was wondering, since you're implementing this in, uh, in Rust, um, so, and then you talked about different uh, ways of uh, term representation, right? That mm -hmm. some are, might be more efficient than others. Um, so I was wondering whether you have experimented with, uh, instead of using the Brian in the chess, using the fact that you have uh, actual pointers to memory locations, in Rust, right, that uh, you could use those to represent uh, variables, basically, which would give you more direct access to the, uh, to the variables and would allow you to do, like, uh, substitution, for example, in constant time without having to traverse the whole term. Yes, so um, I have not used something else than the Brun indices for now. Um, I would be interested to know whether this is something that is easily doable with pointers. I mean, 
so there's there's some trade off because some things become easier but other things become uh, harder because yes. you have to be careful when you apply the same function for example that uh, two different arguments that you do not i mean that you really separate the two terms that you get right mm -hmm. uh, so but i think maybe you could gain more performance even with that it could be possible it is however perhaps uh, it depends on how this would work but in general um, in rust you have a quite a different view on pointers than in other languages so it's not like in c or c++ you are much more constrained um, so this is to ensure the memory safety um, so i'm not sure whether this would fit into this model if it would then it i think it would be a cool thing to try it out um, if it does not fit, to fit into the model, then, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but if you are having an idea how this works, then I would like to talk with you about it afterwards. Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know too much about, I know a bit about Rust. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I don't know about this pointer stuff, how, how you would encode this, and, uh, but I know Rust, so yeah. you could no, just... That's, that's awesome. Okay, cool. But in general, this kind of point, uh, this, this term representation, oops, is uh, also really has been like one of my uh, main uh, centers of curiosity in the in the last months. And this is also where I have worked a lot, um, like recently, and I made some some nice advances here. But this is like much too much too complicated, like to, to show here. Yeah. Uh, Rust, uh, the, the, two, uh, the, the general question is why Rust? Mm -hmm. The sub question is as far as I know, it's very good for parallelizing things. Yes. Did you use this feature at all? Yes. So, uh, why Rust? That is actually at the beginning, I did start to make a parser in Haskell for, for Deducti. So I think I made like three parses for the Dukti actually, and the first one was in Haskell, but it was really slow. And it would have taken me ages to just parse these files I was usually dealing with. So um, that's why I then just thought, hmm, performance, and I looked for it in the internet, oh, Rust, hmm, perhaps I try this. And I was quite getting hooked on this then. It's now my favorite programming language, which was before Haskell. Um, and regarding your second question, this time I didn't forget it. Uh, uh, so the parallelism is indeed something which people then told me, uh, at first I didn't care about this, but then people said, yeah, mm, why don't you do this stuff in parallel actually? And I found out that this was actually not trivial at all uh, to do for a proof checker, um, to have it like to be fast in single threaded mode, but also be parallel and also be fast there. And this, um, however, now I found some really cool thing, like some heterogeneous term uh, uh, stuff where I use actually different types uh, of terms depending on where they are um, in order to have this um, multi-threaded, uh, multi-threading. But it's not uh, trivial and it's not so easy to come up with that at first, yeah. But I, I'm very happy with them. At least the multi-threading in Rust is really cool. <laughs> okay, no more questions. So thank you very much, Je sais, mais Catherine n'a pas besoin de toute façon.